On 01 December 1944, Desron 53 was assigned to Task Group 38.1. The same day, Task Groups 38.1 and 38.2 received orders to proceed to the Philippines. The group began to assemble around the carriers Yorktown, Wasp, Essex, and Cowpens. The brand new Cleveland class light cruiser USS Astoria was chosen as the group's guide ship. After sailing just half a day, the Navy recalled Task Group 38.1 with orders to return to Ulithi. The group reversed course and filed back into the lagoon after sunrise on 02 December. By 0930, Halsey Powell was again moored inside the Ulithi Atoll. The task group spent the next eight days in Ulithi, which gave the crew more time to enjoy the facilities on Mogmog. The island had a movie theater, beer garden, swimming area, a stage for shows, a chapel, and a baseball field, all to give the sailors a place to blow off some steam and to forget about the war for a few days. On 10 December, orders came to make way for the Philippines. Desron 53 sailed out of the lagoon at 0400 and joined a group that was forming around the carriers Yorktown, Essex, Ticonderoga, and Wasp. Just before 0700, the 14,000-ton Baltimore-class cruiser USS Boston rang up in a head standard bell, turned, and led the group northwest. During the voyage, simulated air attacks were conducted, preparing the crews for the inevitable attacks that would come their way. On Thursday, 14 December, the force was east of Luzon. Airstrikes were launched once CAP and ASP patrols were aloft. Their mission was to impede the enemy's ability to interfere with the American landings on Mindoro Island by destroying as many enemy aircraft as possible. The next day, 15 December, the invasion of Mindoro began 400 miles southwest, while the group continued their airstrikes on Luzon to eliminate Japanese air power. But make no mistake, the enemy fought back with fierce anti-aircraft fire. Many aircraft returned damage and some didn't return at all. Destroyers constantly looked for airmen that ended up in the sea. At 1319, a Grumman F-6F Hellcat landed in the water 500 yards ahead of DD-686. Minutes later, Ensign L.B. Urbano from the Yorktown was pulled from the water. Air attacks on Luzon ended on 16 December as the group retired northeast. They began at sea refueling Sunday morning, 17 December, as weather conditions began to deteriorate. At 10.46, it was Halsey Powell's turn. She pulled up alongside the USS Shikoskia. As fueling was going on, Ensign Urbano rode the breeches buoy over to the Shikoskia as she was slated to meet up with the Yorktown later. By noon, the weather conditions had deteriorated substantially and the sea state worsened. Fueling operations became dangerous and were called off until weather conditions improved, leaving several destroyers low on fuel and light on weight. Despite the poor weather, the USS Wasp was still conducting flight ops, with the Halsey Powell on plane guard duty. At 1500, one of her airplanes ended up in the sea, and DD-686 went to retrieve the pilot. A two-hour search in the choppy seas revealed nothing. The ship had to return to the formation empty-handed. Eighteen December 1944 would prove to be as deadly to the fleet as any Japanese attack. Winds increased and the sea state deteriorated. Attempts were made to fuel destroyers not able to top off yesterday, but the weather wasn't going to allow it. At 0900, the eye of Typhoon Cobra was being painted on radar 75 miles away. 
wind speeds began to exceed 100 miles an hour. The escort carrier Cowpens had aircraft on her hangar deck break free of their tie downs. They crashed into bulkheads and each other. Fire broke out, turning the deck into an inferno. Making matters worse, Cowpens was now moving so slow in the huge swells, she was losing steerage way, a situation where her rudder was becoming ineffective at controlling the ship. Halsey Powell and USS Benham were ordered to remain with Cowpens as she dropped out of formation. The two destroyers could do nothing but watch the lightweight escort carrier wallow in the rough seas, black smoke billowing from her decks. Cowpens fire control teams weren't just battling the flames, they were also battling a deck that was severely pitching and rolling, constantly trying to throw them off their feet. Amazingly, these young sailors brought the flames under control, and by 12.15, they had put the fire out. Things were beginning to improve. By 15.30, the winds began to abate, and the sea state improved. The fleet began to assess the damage. The Jeep carrier Monterey had also experienced fires when aircraft were tossed around her hangar deck. In fact, nearly every carrier lost aircraft and equipment of one type or another. But the absolute worst was the total loss of three destroyers. The USS Hall and USS Monaghan, both 1,500-ton Farragut-class destroyers, and the USS Spence, a Fletcher-class destroyer, were nowhere to be found. They were gone. All three had missed their fueling opportunity yesterday leaving them poorly ballast for riding out the storm. Reports indicated that each vessel suffered a similar fate. Huge waves prevented the vessels from making the headway necessary to keep their rudders effective. One minute they were riding high atop a crest of a huge wave. The next they plunged deep into a trough and were surrounded by mountains of inky black water. The ships were seen healing over in excess of 70 degrees at times. Their lack of ballast left them sluggish to right themselves. As one swell laid the vessel over, another washed over it. Hundreds of tons of seawater flooded down the funnels, inundating the engine rooms. They never righted themselves. As swells swept over the vessels, they capsized and disappeared below the surface in seconds trapping hundreds of crewmen below decks as the ships foundered and sank. Nearly 800 sailors were lost. The day after the storm, Halsey Powell and the rest of Task Group 38.1 looked for survivors. The carriers launched aircraft to search aloft while the destroyers sailed in search grids. The Halsey Powell had lost both of her whaleboats. The deck in front of the number one gun was bowed inward, and the bulkhead just after that gun badly damaged. The oilers returned and the ships that needed it were finally topped off. At 11.25, one of Halsey Powell's sailors was washed overboard but he was quickly recovered and was back on deck just 10 minutes later. At noon, a fighter plane from the USS Wasp landed in the water 500 yards ahead. DD-686 wasted no time and 15 minutes later, they had a soaking wet Ensign HF Metzer on deck. The task group spent the next two days searching for survivors. The USS Taberer, a 1,300-ton Butler-class destroyer escort, was found to have rescued 55 survivors. Most of them were picked up during the height of the storm. 41 men were from the USS Hull and 14 from the Spence. Search efforts saved another 36 sailors from the turbulent Pacific waters. When all was said and done, out of 257 souls aboard the USS Hull, 62 survived. USS Spence had a complement of 339, 24 survived. USS Monaghan had a crew of 262, 
Only six remained. Search and rescue operations continued until the afternoon of 22 December when search operations were called off. The group returned to Ulithi, arriving on 24 December. The next day was Christmas, 1944, but the crew lacked the Christmas spirit. Most simply wished they were back home. The cooks tried to buoy their spirits by preparing a nice turkey dinner that afternoon. Christmas Day was spent in Ulithi, as were the next several. On Thursday, 28 December, Halsey Powell was attached to Task Group 38.3, while the remainder of Desron 53 remained with Task Group 38.1. Two days later, on 30 December, DD-686 got underway at 0700, screening the heavies of Task Group 38.3 as they formed up. The group set course northwest. The next day was New Year's Eve. As 1944 passed into the history books at the stroke of midnight, the crew of Halsey Powell faced a brand new year. A year that many a young sailor hoped would bring an end to the war in better times. On 02 January 1945, Task Group 38.3 was refueling 350 miles northeast of Luzon. DD-686 was one of the first to pull alongside the oiler USS Marius. When done, the day was spent on plane guard duty with the carrier Essex. At dawn on Wednesday 3 January, the carriers attacked Japanese positions on the island of Formosa. Just like yesterday, Paul Zipal was on plane guard duty with the Essex. The day was routine until 1805, when an aircraft crashed into the sea 700 yards off the Port Pau. The aircraft had already sunk by the time Halsey Powell reached the location, finding only an empty life raft. Apparently, the pilot remained strapped inside his airplane. Such was the fate of too many young naval airmen. At sundown, DD-686 sailed ahead of the formation to spend the night on radar picket duty. This required her to remain at least 12 miles away from the group, using her radar and sonar to extend the range of the group's eyes and ears. Overnight into 4 January, several times radar spotted Japanese aircraft heading their way. CIC vectored their night fighters to engage the enemy planes. After several were shot down, the remainder turned and fled. At dawn on the 4th, Halsey Powell returned to the formation to screen the carriers as they began air ops. Airstrikes were planned for targets on Formosa and Okinawa, but poor weather hampered operations and only a fraction launched. 05 January, the group refueled and moved 150 miles east of the northern tip of Luzon. On the morning of Saturday, 6 January 1945, the weather was poor. The carriers didn't launch airstrikes until after the noon hour. That night, the Halsey Powell spent in stormy, heavy seas on radar picket duty. At 0200 on the morning of 07 January, radar began painting a return bearing 314 degrees, distance 20 miles. The bridge steered a course for the contact, but it faded then disappeared. Radar nor sonar were able to see or hear anything. Later, at 0308, radar began painting a return bearing 265 degrees distance 19 miles. This time, three separate returns could be seen on the PPI. The CIC guys determined they were friendlies from one of the other task groups, allowing the crew to rest a little bit more easy. Sea states remained high that day and continued to hamper air operations. The group refueled on 08 January. Halsey Powell received orders to report back to Task Group 38.2 as it moved back toward Formosa. The group spent 09 January launching airstrikes on Japanese bases on the island. 
When the last aircraft was retrieved that afternoon, the group proceeded south through the Bashi Channel into the South China Sea. On 11 January, Halsey Powell and the rest of Task Group 38.2 was operating in the South China Sea. They were to attack elements of the Japanese Navy in and around Saigon and Cameron Bay in French Indochina, which is modern-day Vietnam. A small group was carved out of the larger task force and designated 34.5. The group centered around the battleships Wisconsin and New Jersey. It also included three cruisers and a handful of destroyers, including the Halsey Powell. DD-686 and two other destroyers were picked for a special mission to attack Japanese ships in Cameron Bay. As recalled by Lieutenant Ed Collander, We got word there were four Japanese battleships anchored inside Cameron Bay. We were ordered to go and get them. Admiral Halsey himself sent us a light message saying, have your fish greased and ready and may the Lord have mercy on your souls. Halsey had never appealed to God before, so this looked like it might be a one-way trip for us. The harbor entrance was half a mile wide with high hills on either side. We would be the number three destroyer as we swept by the entrance to launch our fish. At 30 knots, each ship would be visible for one minute. Number one might make it past the entrance by surprise, but number three could expect a real shootout in the dawn attack. We would be in the water for sure. I remember holding my Colt 45 thinking it would be hell swimming with that thing. That morning a reconnaissance plane reported the battleships had disappeared overnight. Instead of relief, we were angered and now chopping at the bit for some kind of action. With no Japanese ships found in Cameron Bay, Task Group 34.5 was dissolved and the vessels rejoined Task Group 38.2. The carriers launched strikes on Japanese ships all along the French Indochina coast. The tally on 12 December, more than a dozen enemy vessels were sunk and many more damaged. At least 11 enemy aircraft were shot down. The group was refueling on Saturday, 13 January, when word came over the TBS that a man had been swept overboard on the USS Astoria. Lookouts on the Halsey Powell spotted Marine Captain G. Armitage bobbing in the waves and had him safely back on deck 10 minutes after the radio call came in. Halsey Powell transferred Captain Armitage back to USS Astoria before sunrise on Sunday, 14 January. Throughout 15 and 16 January, the group operated southeast of Hainan Island in the South China Sea, launching airstrikes on any and all Japanese ships its pilots could find along the Vietnam coast. While Japanese aircraft did approach the group daily, they were mauled by CAP aircraft before they could become a threat. The group needed fuel by 17 January, but the weather was poor. While not bad enough to prevent the carriers from launching patrols and airstrikes, it was bad enough to prevent Halsey Powell from fueling. After snapping the fuel line twice, it was called off until the sea state improved. But the weather seemed to have other ideas. On Thursday, 18 January, it had gotten so bad it now hampered air ops and the ships spent the day doing not much more than riding out the rough seas. Finally, on Friday, DD-686 was finally able to fuel from the USS Caliente as the group steamed northeast back toward the Balintang Channel. Enemy aircraft were periodically observed approaching on radar, but none and it passed CAP aircraft until late in the afternoon. At 17.30, several determined Japanese pilots broke through and made a run on the task group. Ships opened fire. Flak erupted around the incoming airplanes, peppering them with splinters of hot iron. The attackers broke off their attack and fled. In 1912, the enemy returned. Cap aircraft mauled this group as well. The few that made it through the gauntlet were met by thousands of any aircraft rounds as batteries opened fire. 
Finding themselves in a storm of metal shrapnel, this group of Japanese pilots also fled. Several friendly shells exploded close aboard starboard of DD-686 during the engagement, showing just how dangerous these actions can be when hundreds of guns throw thousands of shells into the air. It was not uncommon for ships to be struck by friendly fire. That evening, the radio room piped Tokyo Rose throughout the ship. The Japanese broadcast the radio show in the hopes of sapping American morale with propaganda. But in reality, most sailors welcomed the music and got a good laugh from the exaggerated and most of the time false stories. She was a source of distraction and entertainment aboard the ship. For radio man second class Paul Rayucci, he remembered listening to her broadcast that night. She was talking about how the Third Fleet was now trapped in the South China Sea. And if we attempted to come through the Bashi Channel, the Japanese Air Force was waiting and would annihilate us. This did give the crew something to think about. But like it or not, the fleet would be going through the channel that very night. The task force went to general quarters in preparation for the inevitable onslaught. However, as the fleet transited the channel, the only damage that was inflicted were to aircraft of the Japanese Air Force as yet more of their airplanes were shot from the sky. Once through the channel, the group moved off the east coast of Formosa. At dawn, the carriers began striking positions on the island. The Japanese retaliated and threw attack after attack against the Americans. Cap aircraft shot them down or chased them away in a lopsided battle aloft. The Japanese were losing aircraft and pilots at a rate they simply could not sustain. But they continued to send more. And when they did, they too were shot from the sky. As the Japanese grew more desperate, the Americans would see more and more kamikaze attacks. At 13.30 that afternoon, the crew of the Halsey Powell witnessed a huge explosion on the carrier Hancock. They thought she had been struck by an enemy bomb or torpedo. In fact, it was actually one of her own. A TBM torpedo bomber had just come aboard with a 500-pound bomb lodged in its bomb bay. It fell onto the deck and exploded. Fifty of her crew died instantly. A raging fire erupted on the flight deck and below in the hangar deck, where another two fully fueled fighters were also destroyed. Amazingly, the fire crews extinguished the blaze on the hangar deck just 10 minutes later. The flight deck took longer due to crew injuries and badly damaged fire equipment. 35 minutes after the explosion, fire crews had all of the fires out. Wasting absolutely no time, damage control began repairing the flight deck. Less than two hours after the terrible explosion, the Hancock was again retrieving aircraft at 1520. Task Group 38.3, 30 miles away, was also under attack. The Ticonderoga was struck by two suicide bombers. The USS Langley was struck by a bomb. The destroyer Maddox was badly damaged when a kamikaze crashed into the ship. The Ticonderoga and Maddox were out of the fight and had to retire to Ulithi. The next day on 22 January, the task group followed, entering the safety of the lagoon on 24 January. <laughs> 